originally planned because many departments were still having acting DGs or they were merging uh, or contracts had expired. And during that period, it wasn't easy for people to come in to, to join some of our some of our, our programs. So that's part and parcel of the things we will integrate into the program. Um, I mean, we, we must say also, Chair, you will soon in the coming weeks hear uh, the work that will, the NSG will be doing with Parliament, uh, because in our strategy, uh, and hence I'm talking to the slide that you can see here, in our strategy, we are reviving our relationship with Parliament, because we used to have a program uh, uh, which demo expired last year. So this tag program will be targeted at members of Parliament, together with their support, support for committees like researchers. And these are the two programs that are shown on the screen now that will be rolling out. We are finalizing the MOU. We, we didn't see a report on it in the fourth um, quarter because there were no numbers that graduated during that uh, period. But with the revival of the MOU with the Secretary of Parliament, we are hoping that many members of this committee will join some of these programs because these are accredited uh, certificates offered by the two universities that are here. To expand our reach, we must work more with universities and we work on them on the basis of demand. So we don't just you know, choose the ones that we like, depending on what the universities are offering, and we'll invite the members of this committee to participate in some of the programs that we are offering here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professor Nguaweni. Members, the, the presentation is now open for discussion. Chair? Sure. Uh, Honorable Gibi. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, let me welcome the presentation by NSG. Honorable Chair, on the training needs assessments, uh, the request for training needs assessments by departments targeted as senior management, or are they across salary levels? If not, what are the reasons cited for this approach? My second one on the, the online learning. Does this approach to offering online courses work better to generate revenue and to target human resources than to offer courses at targeted periods in a year? I thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank Any you other too. member? Chair, um, uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, um, uh, uh, just the first problem, and let me appreciate the presentation of the last quarter of the fifth, uh, fourth quarter of the fifth administration, as it were, in terms of the financial year. But I, I must say that probably uh, the principal is aware and has made an observation and comparison in terms of the performance of departments that it seems like probably the school needs to target the weakest areas that they, 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 the government department underperforms under because we have not been doing very well based on the AG's report, both financial management in terms of supply space, supply management space, and also achieving the predetermined objectives as it were generally throughout all, almost all departments. Is there any then training that would be geared target to target the improvement in those space for the better performance of the department? Because there is something that is missing uh, that needs to talk to, to, to assist the government department to perform better. That, that would be my first question, Chair. <coughs> so, my probably let me motivate that our aim also i hope i share the same sentiment with other colleagues that would love to have a lesser department that will appear before scopa within our term of office the other one chair that i i, I i'm sorry if i didn't hear it very uh, very clearly uh, the issue of the anti corruption hotline has it been very active and what what is the percentage or average of uh, solving those complaints that would have been locked in in the anti-corruption and their types also? What type of those ones that are being locked 
to the hot anti-corruption hotline. The very last one, which is uh, directed to the DM. Uh, I hope, uh, Honorable DM, in terms of uh, recruitment of females and people with disability, will find its expression to the school also in terms of the senior management as well. It's a comment and a, and a, and a positive hope that I'm looking forward to see that. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Any any other member? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> if I could ask a question. Okay, Honorable Clark. Thank you, Chair. It's really just a clarity seeking question. Um, we've been told, you know, in the last presentation and this evening that um, 10 million rand a month has been lost due to cancellations and uh, during um, uh, the COVID period. Um, is there no way that the training could take place on a virtual platform uh, so that these losses don't occur? Thank you. Thanks. Any other member? All members are home and dry. Okay, let me hand over to the school for responses. Professor Nguyen. And Chairperson, before oh, you hand it over there. Oh, I, no, I just... No, 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 no. Yes. Are you eating now? <laughs> no, 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 I've I been... I you here. on apologies, yeah. <laughs> uh -uh, I've been here all along. I started with the meeting. <laughs> okay. No, I, I just want to add something to what Honorable Clark just said now. Maybe if okay. the the NSG can explain to us this uh, loss of money of the 10 million per month, how does it come up? What's happening? I, I understand that we are in the period of uh, COVID-19, some things have been disturbed, but does it really mean that maybe the lecturers or whoever is uh, was supposed to can train a student it's uh, doing what are they paid for not uh, doing their work because i think if there's no training so everything must just stop and how are they losing that 10 million per month thank you chair Chair, Thank the very you. last question, Chair, if I may, I'm sorry to do this. Okay, Honorable Son. Chair, is in relation to the assessment center uh, for, you know, in the public service, what would be the center assessing? Probably if we can just get light on that. Because my worry, I'll say that, is it is it going to be a new structure or is within the current organogram as it were? How do you balance the issue that also we need to manage the public pass, the public uh, wage bill, as it were? We did not have a, 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 an adverse impact on that. Oh, yeah, I thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, over <coughs> to you, Professor Nagwini, for responses to questions that the honorable members have asked. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Members. Uh, with your permission, Chair, can I request uh, my CFO, uh, Ms. Mkwanazi, to just answer the budget, the, the financial uh, questions first, then I will come and deal with the rest. Uh, Pindi? Okay. That request is granted. Okay, she, she's struggling with the uh, connection, um, you know, chair, I can answer. So firstly, the, this, the budget structure of the NSG uh, has got, you know, two uh, uh, sources of funds and we run two accounts. One is the voted funds, which come from National Treasury. they are about 20% of the total budget of the NSG. The second one is the trading account, which uh, account for you know 80% of the revenue, which covers our cost of designing programs and deploying uh, uh, programs in terms of uh, of training. So, and the fees that we charge are kept. National Treasury caps those fees. As a result, 
when there is no training, as is the case during this month, um, during this month of June, based on the projections and the training um, arrangements we had with various departments across the three spheres, by suspending classes, you then lose the revenue that you will have earned by having people attend the physical training. And Treasury does put a cap. So we are moving training. With, that's what we've been doing during the lockdown, packaging most of the training programs to move it to online. However, what we charge, our most expensive online course currently is below 400 rands. Whereas for the people who attend training physically, it's 1,500 rands. And these fees are kept. Uh, and we have that arrangement because Treasury will then, uh, through the arrangement at the beginning of the financial year, give us the rates that we can charge. If we were to use the, you know, the online program and charge the same amount as people attending, we will suffer severely because people will just cancel the, the, the training uh, program, you know, attending our courses as it were. Part of the conversation about the recovery is engaging Treasury around reviewing some of the fees that we are charging. Now, globally, even during this COVID pandemic, many universities have moved online and they are even offering their courses for free. But when you want a certificate, they charge you a premium for it, maybe $300. In our case, half of our online programs are actually offered for free because we are targeting the lowest uh, level of people in the public uh, service. And by offering them for free, we are uh, allowing access to those. In fact, we are, as we indicated, uh, we need to invest in our ICT infrastructure uh, and so on, so that more people can have access, even access some of our learning products through WhatsApp in order to reduce the cost of people who are working, you know, in frontline services who don't have access to 4G or 3G data that we, we uh, other people in the major urban areas uh, uh, will have. So that is the story really of the revenue where we wrote to Treasury immediately and we are reporting to the portfolio committee that this is our situation and we are attending to it because we basically are running a business by charging fees and we're not a fully funded department by the fiscals. Our proposal to Treasury Chair, and so we declare this, we, is, we are not going to Treasury to ask that they give us something from the fiscals which does not exist. We are working on an arrangement that says the departments who paid us three years ago and people never showed up, that money is already in our account, in the trading account. We want to recognize that money as income. So instead of going to Treasury to ask that they give us funding from deficits from the from the fiscals, we will rather use the money that has already been recognized as an expense in most departments and convert it into our income in order to cover our lost uh, lost revenue. We back now arranging uh, training in the coming months as we are moving to. The, the level where even conferencing, even universities are preparing to go back with social distancing. It will impact us because we're going to use bigger venues with smaller numbers for to allow the social uh, social distancing. So that is what we are doing. Chair, we're not creating new structures at the NSG. We are making do with the resources available. And the, the center, the assessment is more of a virtual arrangement where we can deploy virtually tools that assist the departments and other state institutions to access the tools and apply them wherever they are without necessarily creating new um, creating new uh, structures as, as, as it were. So that is how we are doing it. Chair, I don't think, um, I mean, as NSG, we will find a situation where we end up in, in, in Scopa. We are doing everything we can. We're running clean audit and even under these conditions, We've made a commitment to ourselves as professionals and um, to our political leadership that we don't want to see ourselves in Scopa. And that is why even us um, to be able to use the money that is in the trade account, we are going through the accountant general and treasury, we are going through the budget office, because whatever we do to use that money in our trade account must be legal and must be, you know, a, a regulated. Chair, 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 if chair. I may correct, uh, correct the principal, 
on this one, probably the question, the, the, the comment that I make, if I may, Chair. You should have, <laughs> you, 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 you interrupt. No, I just want to, so that the, the, the principal can respond to the comment that I made based on the SCOPA issue. So that, can okay, I clarify okay. myself, Chair? No, Chair, All my right. apology if my English was not clear. I was saying that most of the departments, if not all, they appear before the SCOPA. One of the things that they appear for is the financial management, poor financial management in terms of supply chain. Two is the issue of also achieving their predetermined objectives. And then my comment was saying that, is it not if you haven't done it, to look at what causes can you provide for them to improve their performance, not necessarily our oh, okay. 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 All right. Thank you, Chair. I think Professor Nguyen has heard you uh, clearly now. Yeah. No, thanks, Chair. No, no, no. No, thanks, Chair. I got that. So there is a training program that the NSG offers, Chair, uh, on demand. So these are the training programs where the AG will indicate that these are the areas that require us in a, now, in a group of departments. The NSG will then arrange the training program precisely to deal with the cases that the Honorable uh, 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 is, is mentioning. So there are interventions like those, and in particular, it's around supply chain management, is around the, the chairing of big uh, uh, committees because that is where most of the problems are. So it is correct here. We do offer those programs. Some of them are online and, and those programs, uh, they are designed depending on which level you are at. So for people who are chairing a big committees, there's a specific program designed for them. There are training programs designed for people who are audit uh, officials and other members who participate in bid. And uh, I say on demand because either we re we respond to what the AG has identified as being a weakness, or a department itself can make an arrangement uh, an arrangement uh, for that. So we do have and we are doing them right now um, in our conversation chair with the Salga leadership. We are identifying more or less similar interventions that we will do in the local government sphere as well. Because so far, these programs have been designed for people in the national and provincial government uh, uh, departments. There is an anti-corruption program. It's actually a compulsory one. It's online. Uh, you can access it. Even members of, uh, of, of parliament can access those. We do limit some of these programs, Chair, uh, to those who are in the public sector because the free programs are actually part sponsored by the 20 percent we get from treasury for our for for our operation there's a discussion of whether or not we shouldn't open this to general public and charge them a premium uh, instead of limiting it so but those discussions we could have and take decisions in future currently we are at government department and so our focus is on the public sector and all kinds of states, which is everybody excluding those who are judges who are serving in, in, in courts. Otherwise, our programs are, op are open. The, there is a slide, Chair, which we showed here about our um, employment equity st uh, statistics, slide number six. Uh, the majority of our employees are actually uh, females. We're sitting at 57%, uh, you know, uh, uh, women. And actually, 55% are at SMS level, which means they are managers. Then the youth is 24%, and persons with disabilities is 28%. Uh, As Dino indicated, Chair, we're taking this thing very seriously. The committee has raised it with us before. We are going to be deliberately seeking to increase the number of people, persons with disabilities as well as young people as we fill the vacant uh, the vacant positions. In fact, I must say, in our conversations, and there is no decision yet, I must say, between ourselves as the MPSA portfolio, because the minister and the DM have asked this question about how we can increase the number of persons with disabilities. We cannot chair as government achieve our disability target if we continue to advertise and recruit in a manner in which we do. We have to work smartly with organizations that are training persons with disabilities and 
go and do some kind of a direct recruitment, even if there is competition, but it must be targeted because currently the rules say you must advertise openly. And in some instances, the persons with disabilities are unable even to access those newspapers. So they are unaware that there are adverts that are, that, are, that are going on. So we are talking about those. We do expect that next year, for example, we might see the minister coming up with some innovative ways of helping the whole of government to recruit persons with uh, uh, persons with, uh, with, 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 with disabilities. As I said, Chair, on the online, lastly, unfortunately, we, we, it's difficult for us because we have a rate that is regulated and it's largely because we are targeting public servants, the majority of whom cannot be able to afford if we charge the, you know, a, a premium. Uh, and so we need to allow access for people across the spectrum. And if we increase the fees, and they become unaffordable, it will be a problem. We will, though, in the, the about four new programs that we are incubate, we are working on currently under the lockdown, targeting, uh, you know, uh, ministers and members of the executive at, across the spheres. I must say, Chair, we will charge premium there. We won't charge the same amount of money. We charge two person at level one with what we will charge when we are training ministers and mayors and so on, precisely because the cost of associated with that kind of programs are also higher than training people who are in a front line in a border post, for example, or who may work in a hospital in a far rural um, in the far uh, uh, rural area. So those programs we will be charging premiums. So it will be cost reflective. Currently, some of our programs are not cost reflective access uh, 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 more and more. And for the programs we do with universities, obviously the rate might be a bit higher because in that instance we share revenue and it's cost reflective. If a university is providing a quality certificate, charging a particular fee, they will charge that fee and we also put our percentages NSG for coordinating and influencing. The slide there that was shown towards the end that say the NSG will now be doing its work by directly training, by influencing the training being done by other institutions, especially universities, also by referring so that if there are programs that are in demand which we don't have the capacity to do, we can then refer those employees to other training institutions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nguyen and your team. You, you are now released. Uh, DM, we are now going to take um, Center for Public Service Innovation. Can I get your opening remarks, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister Chikunga? Um, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. We also have the Executive Director who is here with us, Lydia. But I must just indicate, Chairperson, that as the Portfolio Committee Honorable Members are aware, CPSA moved from its offices, old offices, to the heritage uh, 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 building in the department. And, 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 and that actually made them not able to, to implement some of their targets because of the space available to them in that building. But also, let me also indicate to the members that uh, there has been the issue around the reviewal of CPSI and that, that some of its targets they, they will not implement because if they implement and say, say for instance, they are moved to the Department of, 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 of Public Service and Administration, those can actually incur or may, may appear as fruitless expenditure. For instance, if they revamp the website and investment in IT information or infrastructure, and then they are moved to the department, that will actually look like it is a, mm. a, a fruitless expenditure. However, I must indicate, Chairperson, that the minister has delegated the deputy minister to lead this process. We have had meetings with CPSI, with the department, and with both department and CPSI. We have given them some time timelines to consolidate the report that will focus in the main on the core mandate of CPSI and the resources that CPSI require if it is 
to function effectively and efficiently and actually be the innovation or innovative structure, I mean, a, a, a center in government. So we re- worked in that, that report. Definitely we'll be meeting with them next week. And as soon as they make the presentation to the deputy minister, we will take that to to, to the minister. I must indicate, Chairperson, as I, 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 I invite the, the executive director, that even the position of the executive director, it is not filled because of these processes. Members will be aware that the DG of the department, uh, Professor Levin, left the department at the end of last year, that is, at the, I mean, on the 31st of December. And by March, we had a new DG and we have the principal of the school. It is solely because of these processes that we have not appointed the executive director. As soon as we are sure of the future of the CPSI, then of course we'll move on to appoint the director or do whatever that is required of us to do. I will invite the the executive director. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Come in, executive director. Thank you, Honorable uh, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy Minister, for, for your opening remarks. Um, I will be presenting the performance of a CPSI in the last quarter um, of 2019-2020. Next slide, please, Pierre. I will cover those areas uh, as indicated in slide uh, two. Um, the report, uh, as I said, covers January to March. It was audited by Internal Audit and Risk Management Directorate and uh, we've complied with the requirements in terms of uh, submitting to 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 the minister and other uh, national treasury dpme by the 30th of may 2020 during the fourth quarter next slide we had um, seven targets and we're able to achieve five and two were unachieved um, representing 71 percent achievement I must say CPSI has two programs. Program one, um, which is administration. All the targets in this program were were, were achieved. I just want to highlight to honorable members uh, that uh, we were able to implement 100% of, of, uh, um, uh, of, of external audit recommendations as reflected in that, in that slide. Um, other things that were achieved um, in the next slide, it's uh, uh, issues around uh, program two, which is uh, public sector innovation. So that's actually the work uh, that the CPSI does. Uh, we took time to revise a pocket guide to innovation. This guide uh, the, is, is used by public servants, servants and departments to try and infuse uh, innovation within their departments. Within the fourth quarter, we also ran four set specific workshops on innovation, uh, innovation in, uh, leading innovation in the public service. This is where we, we, we're not doing what um, NSG is supposed to do, but through the workshops, we try to encourage departments to replicate some of the innovations that we come across to avoid reinventing the wheel. The next slide. On slide six, um, one of the areas that we're able to sort of have savings as it will be reflected in the financial information. We, we have um, a journal that we publish, it's called Ideas That Work. I want to highlight to members that when you talk about innovation, you cannot talk about innovation and not talk about sharing knowledge. It's very important for us to capture these uh, innovations and share them. Uh, so one of the platforms that we use for sharing is the ideas that work. We've gone online uh, prior to uh, the pandemic, I must say, we're already looking at how we can save costs in terms of printing within the organization. Uh, the next slide, uh, page um, seven, sorry, page eight. I want to reflect a bit on targets that were not achieved. The first target that we did not achieve is the development of new innovative solutions. I must just indicate to members that uh, the way we report, unfortunately, you cannot say you've achieved 50% of the target. It's not that no work was done. Uh, We're able to identify potential solutions as they're reflected there. The first two uh, solutions, that is Block and Guardian Health, 
uh, those are innovations about integrated records management and scheduling. The third one, ID verification, it's where an innovator has found a, a, a way of tapping into the population register, just takes a picture of you through facial recognition, then it will pull out the last you did your ID or when you did your passport and so forth. And all your information will then be pre-populated uh, on, on the app. So you can use that for various, uh, uh, to solve a number of service delivery uh, challenges that we have. Talk to Gov is an innovation where you, uh, citizens are able to engage with government. It's similar to GovChat, but has more functionalities than uh, GovChat. We're able to engage with uh, innovators, but unfortunately we could not pilot uh, some of these uh, innovations because we are still caught up with some projects from the previous uh, performance cycle. One of the reasons why we are unable to do this is that uh, CPSI is very thin on the ground. You'll see when I present uh, HR information, there are only 32 posts within R&D. It's the chief director. We have one project manager. We have one uh, deputy director, which runs with the development of, of solutions and one administrator. So we, we end up with uh, being thin on the ground. We used to have EU funding, which ended in March uh, 2018. And unfortunately, we lost capacity, about four uh, posts that we lost because the EU funding came to an end. Mitigation to this uh, is that the two uh, identified uh, solutions will then be piloted in the health sector as part of the phase two of the maternal referral project, which, in, which we are busy with now in this financial year. And on slide nine, we also have... Uh, replication program. This is where we we find innovations, say, from one province, and we try to sell it to the other province so that people can learn and we, we start mainstreaming. I must say, members, it would be ideal for CPSI, as it was reflected in the uh, a, a quick uh, review of the CPSI that was done by the develop, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 what bank was it? Uh, 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 the previous minister, Minister Ayanda Kloza, requested uh, a quick review of the CPSI and it indicated that CPSI should be working directly, say, with national departments so that whatever project that we come across um, saves government money, is innovative, then the national department can then influence uh, provincial departments to adopt such innovations. So within this financial year, we were supposed to replicate two projects. One of these projects that was not replicated is uh, the Standing Box project, which benefits people with disabilities. It's an innovation that we found in one of the hospitals at, at, in Gauteng, but uh, we, we're hoping that correctional services will then use its offenders to build uh, these uh, standing boxes for children with cerebral palsy. But unfortunately, that partnership didn't bear any fruit. It was a bit late, we admit, that uh, when we started with the mitigation, uh, we were only able to uh, get a purchase order in March, which was already late. Unfortunately, we were caught up with um, the service provider not being able to deliver on time. But member, uh, honorable members, I want to report that as of June, uh, the service provider uh, uh, delivered. We are in the process of making sure that the standing boxes uh, uh, are sent to the uh, replication site, which is in in free state. Next slide. We had a number of highlights uh, in the 1920. Uh, we normally host a, a, an innovation conference, but in the last financial year, we decided that it should not just be a talk shop. So what we did, we introduced mini technique clinics where we called uh, the experts in design thinking and in foresight to come and hold workshops. On the second day, we spent about half a day engaging public servants, showing them how to use designing, design thinking skills to solve uh, service delivery challenges. We were just testing the waters and we're looking forward to working with the NSG to introduce such courses as one of the future skills that we need as a country uh, uh, so that 
public servants who are at the call phase of service delivery should be able to say pull out and uh, use their design thinking skills to solve their own problems rather than to wait for somebody from outside to come and solve your service delivery challenges we are also proud of uh, the trailblazer forum platform that we've uh, we've set up through our hours program we realize that there are a number of public servants who are coders uh, coding is one of the skills that we need as a public service especially now with the 4IR the pandemic has also pushed us into a corner to go online on everything and as it was highlighted with uh, uh, by the school principal that uh, the, the, the lines, the CETA lines sometimes are unable to carry the load of data that one needs for, for, for such tasks. But this system developers or coders are actually public servants. They have this uh, interest in this um, area. They're developing solutions for departments with any of the self uh, solutions. A good example here is uh, Department of Health in KZN. They've actually counter offered their developer who was about to leave to go to the private sector. Olani has developed an e-procurement plan. He has developed a number of online systems for the department to use. And through this Trailblazer uh, platform, we hope to form a community of practice so that they can exchange those skills and you know, make sure that they support each other in terms of making sure that uh, we, we save in terms of IT costs uh, for government. Uh, I would also like to highlight that we also pride ourselves in the way we support the development of youth digital and innovation skills. We do this through hackathons, uh, you know, because they don't have the service delivery context. They have great ideas, but without the service delivery context, some of their ideas need to be nurtured. So through this uh, program, we are able to, to support them and guide them to make sure that whatever they they, 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 they innovate upon will benefit uh, the public service. Uh, excuse me. I would just like to highlight that we still have a challenge because our PFMA doesn't understand buying something that you don't know. You, you can't get three codes of something that you don't know how to describe. Remember, these are innovators. They get these bright ideas, but we need to work with Treasury to make sure that we are able to get those skills inside government so that we can benefit from, from them. We are so used to buying off the shelf that there are solutions by this company and that company, but these young people come up with unique innovations that are so useful, like the ones that I mentioned, that they, they, they are able to do uh, facial recognition, tapping into the uh, population uh, database so that we are able to solve a number of um, problems. Next slide. Uh, we've we've had a clean audit, a third year running, um, and as I, I indicated, that we are working with um, we've done a, a, a project on records management uh, between KZN and, and Houten. We are also working with Home Affairs uh, on a solution that would be able to give them real time. Uh, sense of what is happening at their service delivery units. For instance, if there's downtime, say at Akashia, uh, they shouldn't be calling head office to say we are down. Somebody should get a message to say uh, you have a problem at Akashia uh, Home Affairs and be able to react quickly. If there's long queues, somebody should be able to say uh, deploy more people to, to, to the front desk because there are quite a number of people that are standing in the queue. But that is still a work in process. We'll be able to update the portfolio committee later on, 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 on as we implement um, the solution. I'll go straight to human resource information. We only have 32 posts. So the 32 posts is from the executive director to a cleaner to a security. Uh, currently, the, as, as indicated by the DM, the executive director post is unfilled. We have other posts that are unfilled, which are critical. One is in HR. HR has three people only, so one post is vacant. Supply chain is run by only two people. One post is vacant, um, standing at 10.5%. We are about to lose a deputy director finance, so that 10.5 vacancy rate will go up. 
Again, our finance, uh, uh, without mentioning the CFO, is run by a deputy director and two finance clerks. So you can see that we are very, very thin on the ground. And I think uh, Deputy Minister has mentioned that it's very important for us to move with uh, great speed in terms of the review, because one gets a sense that maybe there's a bit of a panic on the side of employees. They are starting to look for other opportunities because of this uncertainty around the, 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 the CPSI. And I would like to also indicate that we are doing well in terms of um, SMS members in uh, females uh, in SMS level. We are standing at 66.67%. Uh, People with disabilities, we are standing at 5.8%. On the next slide, it's about uh, financial information. Uh, next slide, please. Our expenditure uh, for the financial year is still unaudited. It's standing at 77.67% uh, of the of the total total vote. And uh, next slide, please. I would like to skip uh, slide 13 and go directly to slide 14. Next slide. Next slide again. As you can see on the next slide, um, on goods, uh, on, on, not on goods and services, go back to compensation of employees, please, Pierre. Okay. Okay. Uh, the expenditure is uh, high in terms of compensation of employees because we are all there. But if you look at compensation of employees, uh, major under expenditure is uh, because of the vacant post of the executive director, which has been vacant since, since 2018, technically. And uh, the position has been filled, I must say, over the previous two financial years. It has seen a number of people coming in in acting capacity. The previous uh, permanent <coughs> ED left in September 2018, and from then on, it's been acting three months there, four months there, and so forth. So, and also because the other critical posts in supply chain, HR, strategic management are filled on contract uh, basis. So we've got a bit of saving there. In terms of goods and services, next slide. Uh, our expenditure in good, goods and services. Uh, Pierre, next slide, please. Next slide. I think maybe there's a problem with connectivity. I will go on um, to the goods and services. Um, in terms of goods and services, our major saving is around office accommodation. The Deputy Minister has mentioned that we were moved from Centurion, where we were renting directly with a DPWI. Um, uh, I, but then moving to DPSA, we are making a saving of over four million. And this has been a trend ever since we moved to, to DPSA. We had planned to do tenant installation, upgrade um, our IT infrastructure, you know, and maintain the building as per our MOU with DPSA, but we could not because of the pending review. Uh, when we got to DPSA, we had a number of challenges. I think we were without email and telephone for a couple of months. And with regard to using CETA and transversal systems, uh, CETA was not charging us because we had no connectivity. We had to go to um, CETA premises for us to access bus and PESAL and all those systems. We only uh, started uh, accessing these transversal systems in July. So between 1 April to July, CETA was not charging us. So it, 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 related, it, it resulted in a number of, of savings in that regard. Uh, the next slide, uh, we, we had an arrangement, uh, an agreement with the Innovation Hub to sort of uh, uh, transfer money to Innovation Hub for them to be able to support innovators to come up with new solutions. 
But that arrangement is no longer working uh, very well for us because of change of leadership and so forth. So because we didn't achieve this target, there were a number of savings. The public sector guide was also done in-house, so we had a bit of saving there in terms of printing costs. Uh, another huge saving was on travel and accommodation. As last year, we held the conference and the award ceremony were held back to back. So we had a, a lot of sa uh, savings in terms of travel and, and so forth. Uh, we didn't hold the awards finalist uh, workshop uh, during the set period and we had a savings. The issue was around, uh, you know, trying to, to make sure that we cut on a number of costs. The next slide. DM has already indicated uh, uh, that we were planning to revamp our website, and but we hope that with the review, we will know where to stand because as, as it is now, we actually realize that we, we actually need a more robust website to be able to carry some of the things that we, we want to implement in, in, in future in terms of going online and so forth. So it's, 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 it's quite crucial for us as an organization to bring the issue of the review to finality. And we are happy that the DM is leading the process and that we'll be able to get a direction in terms of whether, you know, IT infrastructure, updating the website can be, we can continue with, with such so that we are able to be more effective as, 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 as CPSI. Uh, machine, mm -hmm. Machinery and equipment as well, um, savings for the same reasons. We didn't want to invest a lot in machinery and equipment, uh, seeing that there will be a review very soon. Um, the next slide, which is slide 18, uh, gives you an indication of how the expenditure looks. As you can see, uh, goods and services is, is actually quite low. So we spent 77% of our budget, which will still be confirmed by the audit, audit process. In the next slide, it shows where the low expenditure is. CRM is corporate resource management. That's where the ED post is. That's one of the reasons uh, that led to the under expenditure there. If you look at program two, innovation, the expenditure is quite, it's, it's quite high where, uh, in those three work streams. But obviously, because you have a low expenditure in, in, in certain areas, then you need to bring down the whole percentage to about 77%. 77%. In the next slide, Honorable Chair, we share with the portfolio committee that uh, we pride ourselves in terms of um, payments not exceeding 30 days as required. Uh, unauthorized expenditure, there was none. Fruitless and wasteful expenditure, none. No irregular expenditure for the fourth quarter of 1920. I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, that presentation is now open for discussion by honorable members. Can I uh, note hands, please? Honorable Chair. Honorable Kibi, come in. I thank you, honorable Chair. Uh, Chair, uh, let me welcome and appreciate the presentation by CPSI. Uh, one is really concerned about the vacancy rate, but what brings a little comfort is that uh, the what the deputy minister said that uh, she they are now busy and running with the uh, review, and we hope that uh, after they, they they finished with it, uh, the vacancies will be able to be filled. Uh, Honourable Chair, uh, my question is on the two projects from the previous performance cycle. Uh, I want to know since new innovation projects could not be piloted due to the duration of two projects from the previous performance cycle, will there be a piloting of new projects in the 2020-2021 cycle? I thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you. Next, Chair. Chairperson, Honorable Malulege. Yes, come in, Honorable Malulege. No, thank you, Chairperson. I also want to join Honorable TV to appreciate the good work that the CPSI is doing. And maybe 
just to highlight on the one that the, the vacancy rate, maybe it will be also important for CPSI to give us their roadmap, even though they are saying they are going to review, they are having a review on the, the, the that will assist them in closing up the vacancy rate. But maybe they can highlight their roadmap in making sure that they do uh, close up that uh, vacancy rate. And also to appreciate the way they are dealing with the disability, because really you can see that they've got five percent of uh, people with disability who are employed there. It's a good thing, even the the the, the female or women who are uh, at mm -hmm. senior, senior management. management. Mm -hmm. Yes, we 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 applaud them for the good work. My, my question would be on the ideas that work, uh, Jenner. I, I heard the the presenter where I was talking about the ideas that work. And I would like to know who contributes to the ideas that work, uh, the public sector innovation journal. Were there any innovation extrapolated from the journal that got piloted in the public service? If they can explain on that one. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other hand? Honorable Chair. Honorable Soma, come in. Thank you, Chair. Uh, probably must also must assist in terms of indicating who have raised their hands because I've raised my hand on the platform. Uh, I'm just saying moving forward. Chair, may I also appreciate the honesty of the of the of the fourth quarter report as it were as presented. Most importantly, the other one that I would like to talk to is the issue of the picture or a photo of a person that recognizes your face then it brings back other picture, old pictures that you would have taken. That I would like to confirm that I've witnessed that one in Devon, in Clearwood Hospital, when we're doing, I was doing my constituent work, where you are able, in terms of responding to COVID-19, where there's a technology that you are able, to, which is able to pre-screen your, yourself and allow you to enter the, the ward or the hospital building, as it were, which is quite, I was just, I'm just so excited that government can deliver and you can see where the taxpayer pay, payers' money goes to. Where you don't, you literally don't touch anything. Technology responds to you as it recognizes you when you are supposed to enter to a ward or a particular ward within the, 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 the building or the block. But also on that point, Chair, probably is the take home for DM and, 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 and all of us as well. To say it does say that as South Africa, we must say what type of the public servants that we need or we desire are also entering and engaging in the space of the fourth industrial revolution, as it were, as it called. The other one, Chair, probably I'll request if it's possible, uh, Honorable DM, to take this portfolio committee in confidence as to when. Does she think that the repositioning of the of the CPSI is going to be finalized? I will tell you why, Chair. It's because for where I'm seated, it might have an adverse uh, report when the AG uh, finalized their report as well within the this current financial year, which is 20, uh, 20, 2020, 2021, as it were. The very last point that I would like to respond to, which I, I totally agree with the acting DJ of CPSI, is the issue of that the PFMA doesn't recognize something that you don't know. You are still finding out way, what it's going to look like and how much it's going to cost. Probably we might as well refer that issue to the relevant portfolio committee that can look at the PFMA and see the areas where they need to be amended so that they can talk and move with times as well, like how the Municipal Structures Act is uh, a cocktail is dealing with as well, so that it can respond, because I just wonder how does the science and technology then deals with that aspect in, uh, uh, of, of accounting for, for the researchers that they undergo or employ. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other hand? No other hands. Uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, can you respond to some of the questions raised? 
Yes, uh, Chairperson, thank you and thank you, Honourable Members. Um, on the question around the review of CPSI as to when are we going to uh, finish or conclude or, or com complete it, Chair, it's as soon as yesterday. Uh, next week, I will definitely be meeting with... Uh, so, so, the, sorry, Jim, Chair, through you, can we request the, the, the Deputy Minister to show the, uh, the video, please? Oh, Mr. okay. Okay. Then I, I'm now up here. We can see you now, Honorable Chiku. Okay. Um, <laughs> what I'm saying is that I will be meeting both the department and CPSI next week because we gave them up to the end of, of two weeks from, I think, the 15th up to the end of, of, of June. And we'll be meeting with them and they will be presenting to us their consolidated report and proposals. And we therefore will be taking that to the minister to say these are the proposals. Depending on the decision by the minister, then of course we'll be implementing the decisions as, as, as approved by the minister. So yes, we want to see this thing finalized. The sooner it, it happens, the better. We are fully aware of the impact of non-decision on this matter because it definitely will have impact on their uh, uh, targets for this year and everything else. Do we need innovation in the public service? That's the question that I think we need to answer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. With that, now we move to your department, Honorable Chair Unga, uh, presentation by the Department of Public Service and Administration. Can, can we get your opening remarks before this presentation? Honourable Deputy Minister. I'm not sure, Chairperson, whether Lydia was not ready to respond to other questions because I just responded to one question. To one, okay. Yes. Lydia, can you come in? Thank you, Honourable Chair. I will ask uh, Piers Gonda to respond to uh, the question around piloting of projects in 20, mm. 2021 and also to uh, about future skills, what type of a public servant we need. But in terms of the roadmap, in terms of vacancies, um, wh what we do is that if, for instance, now, like I said, HR, supply chain, critical post, finance, we will write a submission to the minister to guide us in terms of, because we cannot remain with those posts vacant. We've also recognized that we actually need developers within CPSI. So we will be putting a submission to the minister to, to, to sort of get approval to get some a, a bit of capacity in so that we can continue with our work. In terms of the ideas that work, what we actually do is the other way around. We share what's been implemented in the public service uh, so that other public servants can, can, can learn from that. Uh, to add to what the deputy minister said in terms of the review, I would like to indicate to the honorable chair and honorable members that the CPSI was also established through an act of parliament. So once the report is presented to the DM, the legal process should follow. I'm not sure how, how long it will take to establish or to decide where to place CPSI. So I just wanted to indicate that it was established through an act of parliament, uh, you know, by the amend amending the Public Service Act. I will ask uh, Skondrat uh, to, to respond to the other questions. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and uh, Deputy Minister and, and members. Um, thank good you. Evening, yes, <laughs> uh, good evening, Chair. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, just the, the short answer to the, to the project is yes. Um, some of the projects, obviously, because of COVID in the health sector, are uh, delayed slightly. Um, for the simple reason that access to these facilities are um, difficult and we definitely don't want to get under the feet of those at the forefront of fighting COVID. Uh, so we have focused to online services um, and assisting departments to, to assist with the number of online services from simple things like um, screening questions, uh, to more substantive uh, initiatives uh, like e-leave, etc. So uh, yes, and then the two other projects uh, we will continue with. Um, 
the home affairs and the maternal referral. Um, uh, just to mention, uh, Honorable Chair, um, the maternal referral project is a long-term project and it is what some people would call a wicked problem. Uh, it's something that we have not solved that is contributing to the to the huge um, contingent liability that we have with with health uh, related litigation. And it's one of the things uh, we can look look at how do we prevent it and we can look at how do we manage the problem. This this solution is looking at how to prevent um, some of the problems that we have around litigation, but importantly to deal with the health of expectant mothers. So uh, we will definitely continue and we will be delivering on, on two new projects as well in the new financial year. Um, uh, the, just on the skills, we are working closely with um, NSG in this regard and with TPSA, um, sharing some of the international um, uh, thinking around skills for the future public sector, um, relating not only to um, the fourth industrial revolution, but also to things like uh, building resilience, as we've seen now with, with COVID, um, building anticipatory governance uh, capabilities um, and being able to deal with data and manage data. Uh, we've made presentations to PCTA and we're also engaging with TPSA and NSG in this regard. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done um, and it's a question of um, tailor making it for our local conditions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are now through with the uh, public service innovation. Can I invite the deputy uh, minister for her opening remarks for the presentation of the Department of Public Service and Administration? Over to you, Honorable Dima. No, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, let me again uh, emphasize the point that Che. The, the report that we are presenting, the fourth quarter report that we are presenting to the portfolio committee, is not just the fourth quarter of the annual perform um, of the annual performance plan 2019-2020, but it is also the last quarter of the administration fifth administration, and therefore the last quarter of our threat plan, and as such the last last quarter of the MTSF, which is the government program of action. And, and 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 we are happy to uh, to inform the portfolio committee, as the DG Linda is going to make the presentation that of the 32 targets that we set for that quarter, the department achieved all of them. And chair, maybe to indicate to the members that in terms of a, a, a financial matters, we have managed to pay all our service providers uh, whatever that we're supposed to pay within 30 days. And we incurred no unauthorized expenditure, no fruitless and wasteful expenditure, no irregular expenditure. And we're happy to say that. And on the issue of uh, people with disabilities representation, Chairperson, we are at 3.5%. And you will know that the government target is, target is 2%. And these are the highlights that I think they are worth mentioning. But let me invite the DG Linda uh, to make the presentation. Thank you. Come in, DG. Linda, come in. Good evening, Chair, um, Good Deputy evening, Minister, Linda. and uh, Honorable Members. Um, I'm just showing my face for now, and I will disappear behind the presentation. The presentation, okay, no, that's yes, fine. Yes, I'll also be doing the presentation together with our CFO, Ms. De Masilo, out of the meeting. Um, in terms of the presentation for DPSA, as uh, <clears throat> the Deputy Minister has indicated, we are happy to announce that um, we were able to achieve all our targets for this quarter. We will therefore also just be taking the committee through the quarterly performance trends for the year, as well as our HR statistics and the HR, the financial report. <coughs> the committee will be aware that we present our reports as achieved and not achieved. And we also want to indicate that the report that we are presenting today was audited by our internal audit. 
and has also been presented to our audit and risk committee. Reports were submitted to all the control points as required, including National Treasury and DPME, and that we um, also, as part of our ongoing training, doing monthly reports to assess the progress so that if there's any matters that need escalation to the minister, deputy minister and DG, we are able to raise those in time so that they can be attended to and prevent us from not achieving our targets. Um, one of the uh, highlights I, I can add to what deputy minister has raised is that in December 2019, the minister approved a new organizational structure for the department. The structure was essentially done to correct areas of misalignments that uh, resulted from the previous um, structuring processes. And we have also consolidated functions. And as a result, we have uh, moved from having six branches in the department to having five branches. We are in the process of implementing the structure. We have done the placements of all DDGs, all SMS members, and we are now in the process of um, placing staff that is behind, uh, below the director levels. And we are planning to conclude that process by the end of July, uh, just in time for the performance contracting for this year. What had happened is that because of the COVID, normally, uh, performance agreements are entered to at the end of May, but because of the COVID, there has been an extension to the end of July. So we are um, making sure that we do the placements of everyone in the department so that they are able to performance contract at the end of July. Just quickly, Chair, the, the progress in terms of our <clears throat> quarterly performance, these would have been the reports that have been presented to the portfolio committee. What is not worth uh, noting is that as at the end of the third quarter, we are sitting with six targets that were not achieved. However, we have now since um, achieved all those targets and as a result, we, we were able to achieve 100% of our targets for, for this quarter. I will skip the next two slides because it's just graphical representation of the performance and start with the, the first program, which is program one. These are um, regulated uh, compliance areas that we are reporting on, including the submission of our interim financial statements to Treasury. Um, we are not required to um, submit fourth quarter reports because finance, instead of the fourth quarter, we then submit our annual financial statements that would be reflected um, in the in the annual report of the department, which will be issued later this year. The second target is with respect to the uh, BEE status, and it was a new target that was introduced in the past two years. And what we are indicating here is that um, as at the, the 1st of March, um, the department had processed 57 orders amounting to 4.3 million, and that we had used the 8020 preferential system in terms of B, uh, the BE procurement regulations. We also submitted the fourth quarter report and I, as I indicated later, um, earlier, and as DM has indicated, all the 32 targets that uh, were planned have been achieved. Um, we are also reflecting work that has been done under our internal audit and risk management directorate, which reports directly to the audit committee. <coughs> This report just highlights some of the audits that were conducted during this period. And the focus there was um, on asset and fleet management where uh, findings have been made and uh, the related controls have been planned for. And we have a database that is uh, monitored by the CFO on a monthly and quarterly basis. Um, these were some of the controls that were found to be weak. I think I need to indicate that um, on the sec on the first one, where um, it indicates that there were instances where <clears throat> the users of the vehicles had invalid driver's licenses. Those areas have since been um, de dealt with as part of discipline management processes. So I will not go through all of them. They are, they are highlighted there for um, the information of the committee, but what we can 
report mm. is that we've since developed the required uh, plans with the required controls that will need to be improved so that we don't have repeat findings on this area. Um, we have an internal report that we call the uh, DPSA compliance report. It's not a regulated report, but it's our own internal report that we do in all the areas that fall under program one or corporate services. And we are indicating there that of the 20 compliance areas, those would be compliance areas that um, include compliance to DPSA's policies, fin uh, national treasury policies, Department of Labor policies. And we are indicating that in this quarter, we had two areas out of the 20 that we did not um, comply on. And we have since put in the measures to improve compliance. Part of the reasons was that we didn't have the required staff, especially in the HR component. We've since filled all the HR um, posts and we have uh, improved our compliance um, planning as well as uh, getting a hold of all the areas that would need to be closely monitored to ensure that going forward we don't uh, have areas that we are not complying on. Um, there was a question in terms of the issues around vacancies. I will re uh, reflect on our vacancies uh, later, but I think what I need to indicate is that one of the areas that we have not complied on um, is with respect to the filling of vacancies. Part of the challenges in this regard has been the restructuring processes that we have embarked on, as I indicated earlier where we had put a hold on filling vacancies because we wanted to see that once the restructuring of the department is done, the vacancies that we had, are they still going to be required? So um, we have since developed a recruitment plan that has been presented to the executive committee. And uh, with the easing of the, um, the, the, the stopping of uh, advertising of posts. We have since advertised about um, seven posts in the department and uh, the processes of recruitment have, uh, have begun. Um, the last um, pro uh, target under this one has been the um, report that we submit quarterly to the minister and the deputy minister given an account of the implementation of our bilateral and multilateral programs and agreements with partners in the continent. And the, the report then just reflects some of the key activities that happened during that time, which was the African Peer Review Mechanism Steering Committee. As the committee is aware, the Minister for Public Service and Administration has been uh, nominated as the con continental focal point for the APRM. And we are doing a number of programs both um, on the continent as well as South Africa. Settings that are reflected here are with respect to the APRM, but we also participate in the anti-corruption working group as part of the G20 um, and the African Union Assembly um, as some of the meetings that we 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 including the sixth session of the African Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. The second program um, is the program called Policy Development Research and Analysis. Um, the period included the uh, regulations to support the standard setting process of the Office of Standard and Compliance. And I can report here that as part of the reorganization and the new structure that minister approved, we have now operationalized the Office of Standards um, as well as the Technical Assistance Units for Ethics, Integrity and Discipline Management. And those are the two um, units that were brought into effect as part of the Public Administration Management Act. And um, there would be dedicated capacity to focus on monitoring of compliance to all the public service and administration prescripts as well as assisting departments to fast track the management and dealing of discipline um, cases, including cases around suspension. And the office will then um, have a number of programs, including capacity building, including monitoring, but including escalation of cases if they are not attended to, 
as well as working with other law enforcement agencies to make sure that where cases um, that are, is a result of misconduct um, need uh, attention by the police and other law enforcement um, agencies that those um, cases would be brought before those offices and there be continuous monitoring. This will be done in an attempt to make sure that we come out of the historical challenges that we've had with discipline cases that are not being dealt with timelessly, as well as the suspension cases that um, I think the PSC spoke to in terms of the amount of money that we are spending on people that are on perpetual sub suspensions with cases not being resolved within the prescribed um, cases. So um, we have also started working with the Auditor General in terms of the AG also um, looking at uh, and accessing areas that are related to public administration. And we have worked with the reports that have been issued with the AG departments and 43 provincial um, departments obtained clean audits during the 2017 financial year and that um, the departments have put in place improve, uh, improvement plans to address those areas of non-compliance. And we, as I said earlier, part of our interest in working with the AG in this regard is to make sure that we also start monitoring departments' compliance to the public service and administration policies and regulations. Um, we also um, looking at the issues around the establishment of a national uh, administration to support public administration um, act. And um, that work was done under the project called the Center of Government, which is looking at all the four departments and how we need to synergize a uh, policy development, policy monitoring. The four departments would include your center of government departments, which is DPSA, National Treasury, COGDA, as well as the DPME. As part of this work, um, the committee will be aware that the some of the monitoring that was done by DPME as part of the MPET process, uh, some of those assessments will now be done by the DPSA under the Office of Standards. We've also been um, look, uh, working on a project on the white paper for the transformation and modernization of public administration. This is um, work that we are doing <coughs> to conduct a full scale review of our current policies as part of as public administration and to look at what policies need the review, but what policies do we need to put in place to ensure that we further transform and modernize the public administration taking into account the trajectory of the development of the South African public service, issues around um, deploying IT to modernize the public administration, including service delivery. Um, we are anticipating that um, that work will also link very closely with the work around the single public service, which is led by the minister and uh, looking at the creation of a single and integrated public administration system accompanied by <clears throat> a strengthened legislative and governance framework. Um, we have reported before that over and above the performance man management system, the AG over the years, as well as the portfolio committee had raised that what other tools need to be put in place to have a 360 assessment of departments because it's not enough to just say that the officials have done well, they get a three or a four, when departments are not performing at a governance level, but also on an operational level. As a result, we have seen that we have departments where everybody has been scored as having performed, people even get bonuses. But when you look at the audit find of that department, it looks very bad. So we have started looking at linking the assessment of the organizational productivity with the PMDS, which is managing officials at a personal level, and to be able to then link the performance of individuals with the performance of an organization. We had over the past two years been piloting this tool 
um, it is ready now for approval and we'll be submitting it to the minister to sign off on it so that we can be able to um, have the the tool rolled out um, for implementation by departments. Um, we have also done a similar tool, but different, that also men, um, assesses the organizational functionality, as I've indicated before. We want to look at all the aspects of an organization, including the governance of the organization. And uh, we have been piloting this tool as well um, with the intention of deploying it this year. And some of the challenges, because every new tool that we develop, we want to pilot it so that we get a true test of it when we are implementing it, because sometimes tools are developed based on theory. So we've, we've embarked on a two-year piloting process to test out the tool so that we are able to refine it before it is sanctioned. And some of the things that we have found, I think it's a part of what CPSI has alluded by the tools is, is also low. So as part of improve um, how they manage their data, degree analysis of an institution, so that we don't just measure performance based on financial management or the, the outcomes of financial management, whether it's a clean audit, because sometimes um, the rest of the department in terms of the other processes, are, they are not working quite well. So we want to look beyond delivery of APPs and the budget expenditure to actually all the other areas of functionality um, in a department. Um, the next uh, branch is called the uh, Public Service Employment and Conditions of Service. This is where we continue monit monitoring the how departments are doing in terms of the their vacancies um, and what is indicated is that during the third quarter the average rate um, that uh, departments took to fill their vacancies was uh, oh sorry the average uh, vacancy rate was 9.53 the targeted rate in the public service is 10 percent and we have seen that um, this was an increase of uh, uh, 0 0.38 from the second quarter, uh, which was sitting at 9.15. And uh, the, some of the challenges that have attributed uh, to this increment is that departments have not been advertising vacancies due to austerity measures. And I think we'll see when we also provide the latest report that we will have ready at the end of June, that the vacancy rate would have increased again because of the limited advertising of vacancies that we had as a result of COVID. Of, um, of COVID. We had reported previously to the committee that uh, in the past two years we have revised the performance management and development system for heads of departments as well as the senior managers and we have started monitoring how departments um, are finding the new system and uh, some of the challenges that have been highlighted by departments um, is that certain targets in the key government focus on diversity could not be achieved as departments were not able to fill vacancies and there was clarity being sorted whether the HODs that were affected by the NMOC process of merging of departments were also required to contract during the 2019-20. But as part of the work that we, we are doing with the um, National Treasury and the Public Service Bargaining Council, those issues are being managed at that level um, in terms of looking at how the, especially the HODs of those departments that have been merged are going to be dealt with in terms of their placements in either the, the old departments or the new departments. Um, we report um, on the graduate recruitment scheme, which was a target that um, of the previous MTSF, and we've developed the the graduate recruitment scheme, and the follow um, and the graduate recruitment scheme. Um, the the committee has been briefed in terms of the previous meeting in terms of the progress in this regard. Continuous work is being done um, to also. Um, monitor the number of people, of young people that and the 2018-19 report 
indicates that uh, 29,000 um, interns, learners and apprentices were recruited into the public service. And we need to indicate that the government target is 20,000 a year. So it looks like the departments have exceeded those numbers. Um, at the bottom, we are just giving a breakdown um, of um, those numbers, which will include the graduate interns, 12,000, 7,000 student interns, 385 learners, and seven, um, 775 apprentices. The challenge of placements of graduates or absorption into permanent posts remains um, a problem for the public service. And I think with the austerity measures that we are having, including the cutting of the compensation budget that um, Treasury has been doing over the past five years, and recently departments have been asked again to further cut. The CFO um, will speak to the cuts that we've had to make uh, to make in our own budget that we have returned to the national treasury. And we are just anticipating that the ability of departments to be able to absorb young people going forward is going to be more difficult because of the, the ongoing cuts um, in the compensation budgets of departments. Um, disciplinary cases remained a huge challenge. Um, I think the chair of the Public Service Commission spoke at length about some of the challenges that we continue to face, which range from cases delaying either from the side of the employer or the side of um, the employees who are being um, charged, um, where people either don't turn up for hearings or you find that we don't, departments don't have the requ uh, requisite capacity of initiators, investigators. The graphs on the right show that um, we are having serious challenges in terms of provincial um, departments where 96% of the overall cases are not finalized and only 4% are finalized. The picture at a national level does not look very good either with just over 50% of cases being um, not finalized as well. Um, in terms of the actual breakdown, um, at a national level, we had 816 cases, um, of which 439 are still pending, and only 377 of those um, were finalized um, within the prescribed uh, period. So in the total number of, of cases at a provincial level was 2,053. Um, as I've indicated, only 4% of those have been finalized. And um, of those, only 69% um, percent were finalized within the prescribed 90 days. Um, and as I've indicated, Chair, that the Technical Assistance Unit for Ethics, Integrity and Discipline is going to be focused on this area of work to make sure that um, we move towards reducing the number of cases, both uh, misconduct cases, as well as um, those cases that uh, result in, in suspensions. So um, the, the process of filling some of the key posts, um, all the posts have been filled, except for the head of the, of the unit, which we are in the process of um, interviewing in the, the next couple of weeks. Um, the Government Employment Housing Scheme is another project that resulted as part of the PSCBC resolutions, where a dedicated unit looking at assisting government officials who qualify for the home allowance to be able to access housing and home finance. We are reflecting that as at the end of December, we had a total of 14,493 uh, home loans that have been issued um, at an estimated 8.9 billion which were provided by the South African Home Loans to public service employees. We still have um, public servants who, even though they get um, housing allowance, are not owning homes. And part of the reasons is that those public servants are in debt and there will be programs that we will be looking at, at 
assisting those public servants to be able to get out of their debt so that they can be able to home own as one of the major investments that they they can they can use so there's also current processes that are unfolding in terms of looking at the appropriate structure for this uh, scheme with the with labor unions at the PSCBC. The fourth uh, program is the one th that works with IT in the public service. We have over the past couple of years been reporting to the committee on IT expenditure in uh, government. And what we are reflecting here is that for the 18-19 financial year, government spent over 40 billion as compared to 36 billion during the 17 and 18 financial year. And that the mes uh, major cost driver was BES. BES is a system that is used um, for payments. Um, we have two systems, we have PESAL and we have BES. And um, the major cost driver in terms of the figures reflected here was the best system at over 19 billion. The other projects associated to this one um, as part of the <coughs> Minister Mkuno's um, priority areas of looking at cutting the cost of running public administration, we'll be looking at how we begin to reduce um, the costs of IT in the public service working. Some of the areas that are making IT procurement very high is the third main system that we use, where if a department wants to procure a computer, we pay about 30,000, 40,000, but if you go directly to the market, you'll pay 18,000 for the same computer. So there's quite a lot of work that is happening with CETA and other key department, uh, departments of communication to look at how we use economies of scale to negotiate beta rates for um, procurement of IT goods and services in the public service. And with that, we are hoping that we'll also see a direct correlation between the IT products that we procure and improvement in service delivery. Because at the moment, we spend quite a lot of money buying um, IT products, but the rate and speed of service delivery is not improving. Um, can can you round that, Linda? Linda? Yes, Chair. So yeah, I would move to the... Time is seriously against, against us, us now. Okay. Um, yeah. the, the one but last program then is the service delivery support um, that did work on the operational management framework as well as the service delivery model for the public service, which was used as part of the macro organization of the state. Um, I will not talk about the other ones. We've reported on the Batubili programs before, and we continue monitoring the service delivery improvement plans. And we've also started doing announce and unannounce um, inspections and visits to um, identified service sites. The last program chair is on the establishment of the head of national administration and the head of public service. We are doing that work together with the presidency and some of the things that are currently being debated is where this head of the public service or national administration needs to be located. We'll be able to give progress later on once the work with the presidency has uh, gained traction and so there's some output on that. Um, we continue to monitor um, the compliance with the financial disclosure frameworks. At the senior management level, we've seen improvements sitting at 98%. Other categories of employees were recently introduced. That would be people below your directors. And uh, it's still very low at 57%. And we are monitoring that and uh, writing to departments where there is non compliance so that um, those percentages can go up. There's also work that we've reported on on uh, other remunerative work, as well as um, the directive on conducting business with the states. And those are the figures that we are showing there in terms of compliance in that regard. HR information, we're sitting at um, 13.4 vacancy rates. As I've said, that we are reviewing this post based on the new structure. We will be abolishing some of those posts and for our vacancy rate will reduce. In terms of women at SMS, we're sitting at 47. 
At the last time we presented, we had 42, so we've shown a 5% improvement. And as DM has said earlier, that the number of people living with disabilities were at 3.5%. This brings me to the end of my presentation, Chair. I will then um, hand over to the CFO to quickly run through the financial um, reports. Thank you. Uh, uh, CFO, uh, please mind the time. Our meetings are scheduled to run for three hours, not more than that. Noted, uh, Chair. Uh, good evening. Okay. Uh, good evening, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, and good evening to the Deputy Minister for the Public Service and Administration and uh, colleagues. I'm just going to quickly run through the four slides <coughs> on. Uh, um, uh, financial reporting. This is the financial reporting um, figures that are primitive. They are not only for, for, for the fourth quarter, they are for the entire financial year. Um, the, this slide 23 indicates how the, the, the budget is divided in terms of the vote. 51% of the of our budget, <coughs> which is 508, uh, <coughs> it goes to transfers and subsidies. 31% um, of the budget, which is 303 million, it's a composition of employees, and 18% is goods and services. Uh, the next slide <coughs> deals with the. Um, uh, Linda, please, the next slide. The next Raise slide. your voice, CFO. Yes, <coughs> the next slide deals with the um, uh, expenditure per program. We actually indicating um, from program one to program six as presented by the DDG um, earlier on, this is their performance. For DPSA, uh, the first total there indicates the budget for DPSA excluding the entities, which is 488 million. Out of that, the, we have spent 450 million and the budget that has not been spent for the entire year is 38 million. That is the money that is not spent, which is equivalent to 92.1%. Uh, um, and I'm not going to go through the, the percentage that are indicated in the slide in terms of the program from program one up to program six. The, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the last part of the slide uh, is the uh, transfers that we have made uh, the entire year to the Center for Public Service Innovation they presented earlier on the NSG as well as Public Service Commission. We are actually reporting on what we have transferred and they have reported to, to this committee earlier on on the expenditure. This slide indicates the financial report in terms of the economic classification. If we look at the economic classification composition of employees, the budget of 303 million, we have spent 290 million and the, the budget that has not been spent is 13 million, which is 95% of the budget spent. This is basically the the the, <clears throat> the understanding is basically due to some of the vacant posts that we have uh, highlighted earlier on in the presentation, which we will actually be filling. But my, you will also mind the cuts that uh, have, 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 have taken place this year and that what is going to be taking place. So we, we will rearrange our budget in terms of that. Goods and services, uh, we have uh, out of the budget of 175 million, we have spent 151 million. Um, and the, that is equivalent to 86 or 87 uh, percent. Some of the reason is basically actual savings that we have uh, made in, in terms of the office accommodation on under program one. Um, the government employee housing scheme has also but is also underspent a bit uh, on, the, on their program. And um, as well as some of the invoices that we could not um, uh, obtain from from CETA that were not paid. So that 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 uh, makes the 86 percent and um, the payment for capital that uh, expenditure that is uh, actually normally most of of the budget is uh, around procurement of it equipment we have uh, spent a percentage of 71 percent on that uh, um, a budget of four four million in terms of the next slide the, um, this slide, I'm not going to go through it. It indicates the same information that I've uh, it's just uh, in terms of graphs uh, on composition of employees, goods and services, and transfers. Just a meeting, please. Um, please. Yes, 
The next slide, which is slide number 27. Um, <clears throat> I'm not, go, I'm not going to the, 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 go to the next slide, Linda. The, this slide, I'm not going to go through it. The Deputy Minister has already uh, talked to this slide in terms of the DDJ's payment and authorized fruitless and wasteful expansion, irregular expenditure. We are clean in that area, but this also actually is subject to the final audit that is currently taking place. Uh, Auditor General will confirm our controls. In terms of our controls, we have nothing um, that uh, it's, it's an exception under all these four areas but the AG will actually confirm that we, we believe that our controls uh, for the year have been uh, up to scratch and uh, that will be confirmed. Internal audit has already made, uh, done some audits and they, they agreed with us. That is the presentation from a financial point of view, uh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, CFO. Uh, honorable members, my suggestion, because I'm looking at time, my suggestion is that uh, members must pose questions and then we get the responses in writing through uh, uh, the, the office of the secretary of the committee. Is that, are we in agreement? I'm looking at the time, that's why I'm making this suggestion. Chair, well, it seems like we don't have a, a, a choice. May I? My hand is up. Okay. Yes, Honorable Soma, put your question. The response will be we... in writing. Yeah? Yes. We, we respect that, Chair. But probably we need to change the approach. How do we engage while you are still in the virtual system? that the, the portfolio mm. committee is for us to engage with the department, not to listen to them because the documents are sent to us on time. That's one mm. change. Uh, I, I think then uh, it, there is a challenge there today. That talks to say we need two meetings a week, not one meeting, if they are all departments like DPSA. The, the one chair from the DPSA, let me just uh, say Siabonga, DPSA family. In terms, it's a very encouraging, positive, good performance uh, report that we have stated for the fifth, fifth parliament and the fourth quarter, as it were. But also, Chair, yeah. while we are performing very well, or well and good, we expect more from you to appreciate that you are not only taking care of yourself as a department, but also you are taking care of the other departments. I'm saying this one very mindful that you are more policy regulation uh, driven man, uh, department in terms of your core mandate. But I'm happy that the, the DTG have spoken to the issue of moving forward also, the Office of Compliance and Standards will also be looking at that, which then Chair will say to me, probably in writing also for my better schooling, the relationship and the avoidance of overlapping of the Public Service Commission in some areas that are supposed to be, they are doing in terms of the Act and also DPME. And, and, and how does it relate to ensure that the service delivery plans, which are there to augment the non-performance of the departments, what new mechanism that is going to be there as the Office of the Star of Compliance and Standards is going to play to make sure that there's a smooth synergy and a crossover from the service delivery plans that you have. Uh, I think you have dealt away with those ones. I'm not too sure what replaced them, but ordinarily the business plans should be the ones that are the core and, and the basis of the departments to implement their programs. The other one, Chair, that I'm happy that Ulida also, the DTG, spoke to the issue of the parcel, which is the, my, my most favorite one. And also now the VAT, which is a system that deals with the payment. What is the system that we use as DPSA to monitor the performance of the department? 
is there any particular system or was still more paper orientated on the mercy of people not meeting the targets in terms of the turnaround, which is different from the declaration of financial interest, which is done strictly electronically. The other one, Chair, is the a department, the whole department of DPSA, since we're in level three, is the whole workforce back to work in terms of office, physically, or they, if they, they are not, some of them are still at home. What mechanism to monitor that they do what they are supposed to be doing within the eight hour working hours, as it were? There must be a, a, a monitoring system that is in place to ensure that they do. I know that one falls within the 2021, but I, 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 one needs to seek clarity. I know in previous meeting it was raised, but differently. The other one, Chair, that I would like to get a written response is the issue of the disciplinary management pool that the department had before to ensure that they speed up the disciplinary uh, issues. What is there in place? Because there were challenges that it was at a mercy of the presiding officer to sit and, uh, and, and start the processes and all that. There is, seems, seems like a, a backlog on the, there is a backlog. What is the new then which augments or is that senior management pool that was supposed to be pulled from different departments to assist in disciplinary cases? The very last one, Chair. Uh, no, I'm saying there's nothing because in terms of the financials also, uh, 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 there's nothing that one can raise. Safe to say that moving forward, just to confirm, I'm sure it will be in writing since we now we've got more budget votes under DPSA family as it were, which means then there will be lesser transfers because we'll be left with the DPSI only, which is going to be repositioning one way or the other. So which means we'll have Mr. one budget with no transfers. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for the opportunity and well done, DPSA. Uh, thank you. Honorable Kibi. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, let me also welcome and thank uh, uh, the department for the job well done. Honorable Chair, mine is only one because uh, Honorable Isoma have made a, a whole lot of grocery. According to the Central Supplier Database, as at March 2020, the number of public service employees conducting business with organs of the state was 270, 11 in official capacity, which is quite a lot, uh, Honorable Chair. What is the department going to do with this information and when? My second one is, Added on the report on uh, service delivery improvement plans, it indicates that there is poor monitoring of the implementation of the plans. Who is the custodian of the service delivery improvement plans in the public service? And what have they done to ensure proper implementation? I thank you, Honorable Chair. Honorable Maluleke, is there any question from you? No, Chairperson, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the responses will be in writing to Chair, honorable Chair, members. Chair, I've got mm -hmm. some questions. Uh, you have not indicated, honorable clerk, but take the platform, ask your question. It's very difficult on this platform, Chair. <laughs> With the Zoom, at least you can raise your hand. Yeah, you can't do it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, Honourable so, Clerk, your question. Uh, um, Chair, I'd like to know how has the supplementary budget impacted on the departments and how is the departments planning to implement their spending cuts? Then um, uh, uh, Honourable Kibi also spoke about, um, you know, the, the officials uh, doing business with government. In actual fact, the number that the the number that's quoted in the in the report is different to what I received today in official questions asked to the department. The number in, that they'd given me was 433. Now, Chair, we'd like to see. I would really like to see a report come to this committee around these officials and what actions have been taken and where where the progress is in dealing with this in terms of the status of investigation. 
And then, Chair, just before we broke up, uh, just before we uh, had to go uh, into lockdown, our last um, committee meeting we had um, at, at Parliament, we had a report given to us around the suspensions and disciplinary cases by the DG. And there were certain factors that us as the committee were not happy about, and we wanted a lot more information in terms of that report. I would really request for that report to come back to this committee so that we can deal with the issues of suspensions and disciplinaries, because it's really a sad state of affairs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Clark. Uh, Honourable members, thank you very much. Let me thank the Honourable Deputy Minister and her staff. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much. Long live the Chair.